Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Josh Hall. I'm a writer, and this is Ryan from the band Algiers next to me. Uh, we're going to be talking... Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> Uh, we're going to be talking a bit about, uh, I suppose, broadly, the intersection of music and politics, I think. Um, Ryan's going to start us off with a sort of 15, 20-minute talk, and then we're going to have a chat, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Here you go. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Can everyone hear me okay? You'll have to forgive me as well, because I will be reading off a script, and the, the text is extremely tiny. So if I stumble over words, or if I get a little bit lost, please forgive me. It's really interesting to be here. And uh, I thank you, everybody, for coming tonight because it's a, it's a really special privilege to be in Berlin and to actually engage in, in music and the wider arts as well. I think um, it's not something that we often get to do, even though as a band we're very much committed to expanding music beyond the actual sound of music and actually engaging with the notion of political struggle and the notion, just engaging with the idea of culture. I know it, it can be a bad word sometimes, but just engaging in that generally. So um, it's, a, it's a real privilege, and I thank you, everybody, for being here. So horror and noise in the reproduction of colonial silence. In spite of the spirit, spirited and rather ambitious title of my lecture, there are many things I do not wish to talk to you about today. I'm not here to talk to you about horror. I'm not here to talk to you about noise. In fact, I'm not here to talk to you about genre at all. Now, genre we understand as something that is in itself inherently political. It's something that subdivides and subjugates and brings music within very particular realms. And if we look at the history of popular music, we can see that as something that divides people out. And it's also something that's very racially coded. For all my unfettered interests in the harbingers of death, either real or imagined, from Carl Theodore Dreyer to George A. Romero, and from the real harbingers of death, from St. Just to Jean Brown, from Lennon to Mao, I'll leave that particular historiography to the more knowledgeable amongst us here. Neither will I engage in an exegesis on noise as an umbrella term, as a genre term. I may use both as entry points, but my purpose here today is much more political. What you will more or less hear is a fever dream because we live in an era of the fever dream. We live in an era of extreme psychic violence. So excuse me if it's quite expressionistic in a lot of ways. But luckily I have Josh here to help me pick up the pieces and make sense of actually what we'll be talking about. Of course, the use of the word spirit in my opening is instructive and purposeful. A specter is haunting the world. That specter is no longer communism. For decades now, the culture industry has been loosed from the restrictions of Cold War paranoia, of body snatchers or invaders from Mars. Our news is now free to enter into the world of big budget Hollywood spectacle, conveying a new form of all encompassing paranoia while our culture industry itself seeks to console us. And this includes music, of which our band is very much a part, by nostalgically reinventing the past with increasingly intimate detail. Or it attempts to out-news the news by trading in gritty, found footage Machiavellian neorealism. Neither, however, bring us any comfort. Put together, they instead to collude to create a psychic landscape akin to someone like Argento Suspiria, engendering a new state of hysteria, of which Kafka so eloquently wrote. This is something that we could call the post-fact era, an era so horrifying to the thinking amongst us, first as tragedy, then as farce. Peering out over the mass graves of the dead and dying, the specters of Marx tumble incessantly in their graves. Post-fact is the logical endpoint of postmodernism, a movement that fought meta-narratives to the death and yet left those in power undisturbed. Most accurately manifest in the ranting absurdist figure of Donald Trump or of his fascist friends across Europe or of his violent counterparts in ISIS. To give an example of fact, one elected member of the UK Independence Party said, <laughs> 
accuracy is for snake oil pussies. They speak in tongues of libidinal excess, free to express their racist, violent desires in public without any concern for reprisal. The media serves to provide these characters with a sense of legitimacy, if they, as if they were some sort of authentic expression of a dis disenfranchi disenfranchised public. Zizek de describes the voice disembodied as a source of pure horror. In recorded form, it is undead, outlasting all of us. And in the reanimated re clownish figures of the new right, this voice reaches its pinnacle, reasserting supremacy by calling it fragile, privilege by calling it precarious, the sneaking suspicion that we too can lose our heads. But this is not a universal fear. It is indicative of a very specific strand of horror, white victimhood. It is the last gasp of a group who wish to maintain their privilege unchecked, who want their supremacy maintained in silence, but who also desire the freedom to lash out against anything that or anyone who shoves their hands in the light to reveal the blood dripping from their fingers. This is why I choose to pound away at the notion of horror repetitively tonight. Because horror as a genre asserts the notion that white fears are supreme in the hierarchy of suffering. So the specter that haunts us is the slowly encroaching shroud of irrepressible silence. This is a silencing that pummels us incessantly with images and sounds of horror, hovering like a hammer to throttle, throttle us into eternal submission. Imagine, uh, imagine a boot stomping you in the face for eternity, Orwell wrote. This is the image I want to leave you here today. It's not a very pleasant image. This boot drives forward into our foreheads, but rarely kicks back at the morgue brokers. It is the all too obvious ideological violence of the oppressor, the capitalist, the pundit, who alongside his, and I do mean his, direct use of violence through expropriation, primitive accumulation, neo-colonialist wars and land grabs, engenders a psychological violence so deep and unconscious as to render us both spasming and motionless on the hook in Leatherface's bordello. But what of those who face the daily manifestations of actually existing horror, those at the brunt end of neocolonialism, those bodies rendered disposable by the police state in America, those bearing the marker, refugee, criminal, Muslim, of course, we bleed our humanitarian hearts for the displaced, seeking interminably to locate the authentic victim, the gendered or childlike figure whom we can provide for and whom we feel poses no threat to our existence, but also provides an example to the world that we are not monsters. And yet by assailing us with the images of suffering, they are further dehumanized while we gaze in fear from a safe distance. Mark Fisher has written extensively on capitalist realism, on the grisly dominant discourse that insists the future should not be fought for, that, in the words of Churchill, we must learn to live a bare life with the worst of all possible forms of government, capitalist democracy and its security apparatus. The struggle for human agency to change the miserable conditions that exist on this earth has all but been effaced, despite all evidence suggesting that there is nothing to lose and still a world to win. How has this become so entrenched? Many societies tell ghost stories as a way of policing boundaries. This is the age-old process of defining good and evil, of drawing out the figure of the other, of disavowing the inhumanity at the core of our civilizing project. What makes these types of ghost stories so horrifying is this very indeterminacy. By creating the category of evil itself, we actually become more petrified. Think of the shape in Halloween. He is pure evil, committed to extinguishing our way of life without any a priori justification. And this is more relevant today than ever before. However technologically advanced we have become, or how godless our societies are, Dread is now the order of the day. The stand-in for the bogeymen are endless. However much we fear this form of evil, though, there's something even more horrifying, that of revolutionary violence. 
Revolution has become inextricably associated with a violence of a different order altogether. What do we imagine we, when we think of 1793? Egalitarianism or heads rolling? What do we think of when we think about 1917? Freedom or the gulag? As Mao said, a revolution is not a dinner party. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. And this has become the major impasse of the left. Radicals are possessed by what Alan Badiou called the passion of the real. If you say A, equality, humanity, and freedom, you should not shirk from its consequences and gather the courage to say B, the terror needed to really defend and insert the A. Given this, what is the way forward for the left? And yet, for me, there are many more perverse killers out there, killers that we completely disavow, killers that we completely deny. What to say, for example, of capitalism? It is often theorized as an undead organism. Zombie, vampire, these are the names that are now attached to it. For Marx, the fundamental point of capital is social reproduction. To birth surplus value beyond our physical selves. This in itself is uncanny. It's ghost-like. It operates, in a sense, as a monster. The capitalists are millions of little Frankensteins safe in the absurdist knowledge that they can control and contain a monster long out of control. So how is it rebo reborn? It can be clear that capitalism has no parents neither the loving godparents of social democratic myth, nor the be benevolent hidden hand of Adam Smith's God. No, this capital can only as sustain itself off our rotting flesh, and when it's finished with us, there will be nothing physical left. It's as if commodity fetishism has been engineered as a form of therapy to bear witness to the manifold horrors upon which our societies are built and through which our wealth has been gained is perhaps, perhaps too much to main a semblance of sanity. And yes, we are left chasing after semblance, to pursuing the endless signs and signifiers of hyperreality, nihilism or death, nihilism or death. This hypercapitalist psychosocial realm is a medieval form of capital punishment. Tie a horse to each of our limbs, stick the spurs of the boot into their haunches, watch us being ripped to shreds. One way to combat this is by resurrecting our own ghost stories. This, in a sense, is partially the project of our band, Al Jews. We assert politics, and that's something that has become quite a dirty word, anything from class analysis to collective struggle, as the response to this dreary realization of Fukuyama's famed end of history thesis. The challenge we are constantly facing is to render through art and music this confrontation with the vampiric capitalist world without resorting to empty sloganeering or nostalgia. The idea of impossibility quickly comes to mind. In the names of Thomas Sankara or Angela Davis, Sartre or Badu immediately leap forward in our mirages of waking sleep. We must stick to reclaiming impossibility as a mode of action as a way of reclaiming hope from those whose only idea of the future is a dreary and bloody clinging to the order of things, like leeches on a corpse from which the blood ran dry eons ago. This is why, for me, the Black, Party's Panther's concept, uh, the Black Panther Party's concept of self-defense is so valuable. Like Malcolm X, they posited that the war is waged every day, not so much on the traditional front, but in what the secure white world would understand to be safe, banal, everyday life. For the oppressed, all aspects of existence are horrifying. Economics, the legal system, policing, education, healthcare, language, and identity are sites of physical and ideological conflict. This is not to mention the direct violence heaped upon the South through centuries of colonial conquest. The choice of Algiers as a name is particularly de deliberate in this end. It is a project focused on struggle, memory, and the struggle over memory. History is obviously important. The name itself refers to a very specific anti-colonial struggle. However, it is also pumped through with wider symbolism, solidarity, socialism, the consequences of violence, the clash of civilizations, and the univocal choices of the 
Cold War and the vacuity of political choice in the neoliberal world. Importantly, though, rather than simply gazing into the past, we hope to explore and problematize Fanon's project of futurity. Let us invent a man in full, something which Europe has been incapable of achieving. This fundamentally, fundamentally leads to a particular type of haunting in our music. As Brecht posits, in the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will be singing about the dark times. This engagement with the dark times, particularly the collapse of the emancipatory project and the attendant injustices of historical amnesia, colonialism and racism, tends to evoke a sense of grief, grief and melancholy in our music, as opposed to guilt and nostalgia. But the power of our singer Franklin's lyrics lies in a possibility, a possibility that there is something more to come, a kind of radical justice that goes beyond simple vengeance. In a song that we've written called Remains, there's a refrain that says, where your careless mistakes, where the spirits you raised, we are what remains. And in another song called, And When You Fall, and when you fall, you're going to want to know who, who it really was who took you down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the potential strategies that you mentioned that Algiers use and what I think, what I, what I sense you meant could be a strategy for the left is this kind of reclaiming of our own ghost stories. I was wondering what, what are the kind of effective stories that we might be able to tell here? That's a really interesting question, Josh. Um, I think fundamentally it is about recalling and incessantly pushing forward this idea from the past of impossibility sticking to and clinging to the ideas of egalitarianism, the ideas of collectivity, the ideas that have simply become in a very identity-filled space, passe. So I think that's one strategy that we can all adopt. And it's something that is very simple to actually adopt. It's something that we can do this in our psychic mind. But if we're also talking about ghost stories, we, we shouldn't be afraid to be repetitive to talk about what has happened in the past and to use that as something that is not necessarily following along the lines of what I've outlined earlier on. Something that does not necessarily specifically trade in fear, but reminds us of essentially what has happened, how our societies are built, who has been left out, who is the part of no part. And I think those ghost stories in particular are very important. We lose sight of haunting these days, and I think fundamentally, if we re reassert those stories, we remind us where we come from. But it's not just about our histories of violence. It's also about that project that has been going on, and particularly the modernist project, not sticking to and clinging to the idea of terror or violence as a way to overthrow society or change the, uh, the parameters in which we live but to use that as essentially a motivation and as a source of optimism, not trying to reinvent the wheel, wheel in terms of theory and approach, but also looking to the past. That, that idea of cultural amnesia that you mentioned seems to have become, I think especially in the UK, especially during the referendum campaign, it's become pathological, it's, it's become overwhelming. I was wondering whether you think you can locate a moment at which that has happened in Europe, or has that been a more gradual process? I mean, I think most people would point to 1989, and it's really interesting to be here in Berlin and to talk about 1989, because the long 20th century is basically between the French Revolution, which first attempted on a grander scale to completely change the actual structures of society in a bourgeois sense, but also in a sense of actually physically attempting to assert a completely different order of things. Through to 1989 with the collapse of the wall and with the impending doom of neoliberal capitalism and the horrors that people face through that. And of course, this is not to 
disavow any of the horrors of the left because that's also fundamental to all this that we have to essentially come to terms with. How do we deal with this? 1989 is, of course, also associated with this idea that somehow ideology died in the realm of politics. That, you know, we've now separated politics from ideology and that the role of politicians, of global leaders, is now essentially one of managerialism as, as opposed to anything loftier. How, how do you think we can start to rehabilitate ideology? Because it seems to me quite essential that that's done if we want to make any real progress. It is, and I think that's one of the things that I that I've I've been trying to emphasize in the talk, and what we've been trying to emphasize as a band, the notion that we shouldn't shirk from trying to build something bigger than we are, from actually trying to be optimistic, might not be the best word, but at least hopeful about what we can do as human collectivity, and not shirking from essentially that responsibility. Do you, do you then consider hope to be a sort of radical position? Hope is definitely a radical position. And in fact, I was reading an article by an author recently that talked about how mainstream power, whether that be, as I talked about before, people in the West or with, within a situation in Syria, it actually seeks to suppress the idea of hope. It actually seeks to suppress the idea of the future. When you talk about the end of the history, you're also talking about the end of the future. And I think psychologically that, that is something that for a young person growing up and learning about these ghost stories, about these horrors, is very difficult to come to terms with. So then how am I to act if that is the only thing that exists? And I think the future is extremely important. There's Camus... He wrote a book called The Plague, and the, one of the m most interesting points for me about that book is he talks about people living when they know that they're going to die. It's not like when you're born, you know you're going to die. The plague is here, we are all going to die. But within that book, there was such a hopeful position that we can maybe change <coughs> our, even our interpersonal relationships and seek for something better within <coughs> these parameters. And I think that's very important. And it might sound religious. It might actually sound something that is, is much older than that. But I think at the end of the day, we can't fundamentally exist in a technocratic society. It doesn't, it doesn't actually enable us to have dreams. It only enables us to have nightmares. And if you exist waking up for an, from a reoccurring nightmare all the time, you're literally unable to move. There have been... There seem to have been moments in very recent history, certainly within my lifetime, during which some sort of corrective to the idea that there is no alternative has been posited to varying des degrees of success. I mean, you think about the anti-globalization movement, more recently things like Occupy, I suppose. Why do you think it is that the left has so catastrophically failed to capitalize on those ideas? I wouldn't necessarily say that it has failed catastrophically. I think when you're dealing with such huge forces, there's always, there always has to be a recognition of that history. And there have been very few occasions within our recent past in which we've succeeded to actually combat the structural violence that is imposed upon us. So when I talk about horror, when I talk about terror, I'm also talking about something that comes, that is presented to us at our doorstep. This is something that is taught to us on a daily basis. So the response, therefore, is something political. So I don't necessarily think that it is something of a flailing left or a failure of the left, because to actually, if you're talking about interpersonally, to change your, your ways of living, it is very hard. If you think about the chains of exploitation to which we're all attached, from my shoes, from my shirt, from my drink, it is all bound within these huge chains of exploitation. So to actually break those chains is something that might be beyond an individual, but it's something that we have to look in a very um, realistic or short-term short way. Actually recognizing that a small victory in that sense, changing the discourse is so important. And I think you and I talked before when we were emailing with each other, 
just about Bernie Sanders or about Jeremy Corbyn. And I'm sorry if I'm speaking specifically about the U.S. and the U.K., but that is something I'm, I'm more familiar with. But I had a question posed to me earlier about Jeremy Corbyn. Would you rather to have somebody like Jeremy Corbyn who will not be elected as a prime minister of the U.K. or somebody who is electable? And, of course, for me, it is not about small failures. It's about shifting the discourse. And I think fundamentally, even in mainstream politics, for me to sit here as cynic as I am to talk about people from the Labour Party, people from the Democratic Party, as people who have actually shifted the discourse in mainstream society, I think that's extremely, extremely important. So to answer her question, I would say, I would rather have the figure of Jeremy Corbyn. As difficult as that is, I would rather have that because it definitely offers the opportunity to at least change that discourse and shift that discourse. I think at the same time, this idea of like the electable, electability above all else crowd is just baffling to me because if your ultimate aim is political power into which you can act as some empty vessel for, for other people's concerns, what's the, what's the point? What's the point of being elected in the first place? And I don't really see that, that as something that the left should be getting behind. No, definitely not. And I think we we actually have a lot of conversations as a band about do you think these people actually believe in what they're doing? Mm. Do you think they actually physically believe? Because to be a politician in a party system, to be beholden to <coughs> specific interests, to private interests, that can't be something that you take lightly. So it is very difficult to imagine a circumstance in which you as an individual runs and you are an empty vessel there is something about institutionalism within our societies generally so i think not to sound too cynical but i do think an institution structures your actions even with jeremy corbyn who i went to see speak many years and i was shocked that there's actually a politician that has been elected that speaks at a conference on marxism or something like that even him he's very much constrained by the media, for example, because they've, they've assailed him since the time he was elected, which is actually quite crazy for me, because if you think about the history of UK party elections and UK party politics, to have someone who's the most, who had the most votes as a leader in the history of Britain, and to have that specifically derided by the media and attacked and assailed, you know that there's something going on, and you also know that that might be <coughs> disturbing interests. And you and I were talking as well about there's been a Trotskyite invasion of the <laughs> Labour Party, which is nuts, because if there are 200,000 Trotskys, you know, sitting and hanging out in the UK ready to take over, I think there's probably about 25. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen this blog, but there's a, there's a Tumblr which collects examples of articles predominantly by middle-aged music journalists asking, where is the protest music? You know, where's it gone? Why is, there, why, why is contemporary music so vacuous? Why is there no political aim? A band like Algiers is obviously a very clear corrective to that narrative. And I was wondering what you see your role as artistically and also what you think we can expect from other artists, other musicians, in this extremely odd, terrifying world that we seem to have found ourselves in? Well, it's interesting, because people all, always talk about us, and they say, oh, your music doesn't have, it doesn't have very specific, clear genres and things like that. But for us, it's a completely different approach, because what influences us is music that comes out of very specific social situations. So if you're talking about someone like Fela Kuti, if you're talking even about someone like James Brown, or you're talking about the punk rock movement, the hardcore movement in the US, they occupy similar social spaces. While the music might be very different, the actual space from which they emerge is similar. So I think that gives you a notion of an understanding of how time is categorized and space is categorized. And I think for us, being directly political is less about being a very specific protest band, about shouting against and railing against the system, but creating a space. You know, you, it's, ca it's called Algiers because it's a space in which all these things intermingle and exist simultaneously because they actually do. And I think if we can somehow reassert that fact 
that we live in the same space. We live in the space where hip-hop music is not only conscious and political, but also contradictory. And that exists within the same space as something like noise, which might, as a genre, might not obviously be political, but in its very sound can be extremely political. And if you think about a lot of the movements going on, there are extremely political bands. There are bands who, in presentation, represent themselves as a collectivity of different individuals who represent people who have been on the margins of music. So for example, a good friend of ours, the, the Downtown Boys, it's a very diverse band who come from parents of undocumented migrants in the US and who even in their very being poses a challenge to what has become in punk rock, specifically a very male dominated, a very white enterprise. So there are, there is a lot of political music out there. And even if I think of someone like Vatican Shadow, who's, a, who's all essence minimal techno, there's no words to his music, but actually in his expression, the way he designs his packaging, he's actually engaging in a similar type of project. He's, he, his albums reference Al-Qaeda, they reference Iraq, they reference all these horrifying things. And in that very presentation of something that is supposed to be dance music, that in itself is political. But I also wouldn't necessarily fully blame the media for wanting political music, because if you're talking about the mainstream, you are talking about, and then when I talk about history, I'm also talking about spaces in which they reproduce themselves. So now feels, even though I wasn't alive at the time, if I read about the late 70s, now it feels like the late 70s. Now it feels medieval. It feels very much devoid of these types of things that we are seeking. And I think that's really important for maybe bands to recognize, or you know, I didn't really talk a lot about music when I was speaking, but I was talking about the culture industry in general. That could be film, that could be literature. I think that's something that's really, really important to emphasize, and to emphasize divergent ways of talking about politics and being political without necessarily being a rage against the machine or something that is just overtly talking about issues, because Stokely Carmichael would say, once you talk about issues, you lose politics. I think we've probably got five minutes for questions, um, although I've just turned around and I can't see a single thing. <laughs> so <laughs> this might be more difficult than I previously thought. But if anybody wants to stick their hand up and I'll see desperately if I can see anything. I can hear Frank laughing over there. <laughs> so the, the rest of the band are over there in that corner, if you guys want to answer any questions. <laughs> anybody want to start us off? No, in that case, do you have anything that you'd like to wrap up with? No, I don't think so. I think we've 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 come here and made everyone thoroughly depressed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Ryan, thank you very much, and thank you all very much for coming. Good night. Thank you all.